We are in the last week of Vibes. Everybody say Vibes. And so I thought to, uh, to wrap up the series, we kind of kind of bring it back full circle and talk about what this word really means before we jump into what we're going to talk about today. Um, but Vibes really has a couple different meanings that are really neat and kind of cool if you, if you just kind of look at the definitions. And so Vibe actually has a slang meaning, meaning that I want to talk about first. And it really just means to get along well in a relationship. And so some of the younger folks are going to relate to this probably more so than some of the older folks. But um, anybody ever say, uh, I really kind of vibe well with that person? Or, yeah, we, you know, we, we vibe. Anybody? Anybody use that kind of language? See, it's mostly the young folks over here. But, you know, you kind of understand what that means if you say, hey, yeah, we, we, I understand their vibe or I like their vibe or, you know, we vibe well together. So it kind of means just to get along well in a relationship. Um, and so there's a specific principle in relationships that we're going to talk about today specifically that just really kind of ensures that we get along well or that we just vibe. And so another, another part of that word, another meaning is uh, a vibe is something that is sensed. It's not really something you can see or touch, but it's more something that you feel. It's like an atmosphere or an aura that somebody has. And it's just kind of like, you know, hey, I like their vibe. I like the vibe they put off. And so for us here at Epic, relationships is one of our core values. So obviously that's, a, that's an important thing that we want people to feel when they walk in and when they're a part of the church. We want you to feel how important relationships are to us. So we want you to catch that vibe, the vibe of relationships. And so the specific principle that we're going to talk about today as it relates to relationships is the vibe of unity. So everybody say unity. Okay, this side, y'all are on it, okay? Y'all can, over here. Can we all say unity? unity? Okay, and all the people online are screaming it too, I can tell. So I, I want to show you an example of, just to get us going, kind of warm us up a little bit about what, what unity really kind of looks like. And so we've got a picture we're going to pop up on the screen. You guys will see it. And this picture is from our East Watini campus. Okay? Yeah, y'all can clap for them. They're awesome. <clears throat> and so it, what, what you can obviously see is like potatoes and flour and, you know, it's just like piles of food and it's all bundled up and they're getting ready to bag it up and they're going to deliver it to homes to people in need. Right? So this is happening at our East Watini campus. But the cool thing about it and where we see uh, the unity happening is that our East Watini campus did not provide this food. Our Carson City campus provided this food. And so uh, a campus, a group of people in Michigan, in the United States, said, hey, we want to send some money to another group of people so that we can provide food for them. So I just thought that was really cool. It's a good picture of unity. Um, you know, we see unity across the board when you look at like franchises of restaurants or, or businesses or companies or whatever, and you go, they're all unified in how they look and operate and different things. So church really, when you're in multiple campuses, is kind of the same way. Like you have to be unified in the way that you believe in certain things and the, the things that you stand for. So a group of people in Carson City, and let me just remind you, if you haven't been around long enough to know this, that Carson City is, is really brand new. It's a brand new campus. They were, they've been in their building two weeks. I think this is the second week. And so it's a group of about 30 or 40 people meeting right now, maybe a little more than that. And so it's not hundreds of people, and they're just, you know, it's, it's a small, tiny, uh, freshly started church that said, you know what? We, we're a part of this vision. We buy into it. We share the same beliefs and perspectives as you people in Decatur and Athens. And so we would like to get our money, our resources together and do something to impact another community because we share the same vision. We share unity with, with that community. So I just thought that was pretty cool. That's a good picture to start with so we can jump into this unity talk. And so before we can, we have to understand what unity really is. And I don't know about y'all, but sometimes I find out more about things by finding out what they're not. You know what I'm saying? Like sometimes you just have to process of elimination things to understand them better. And so I want to start with this. Unity is not uniformity. Unity is not uniformity, okay? And so what is uniformity? Uniformity is this. It's the quality or state of always having the same form, manner, or degree. So uniformity, always the same state, uh, form, manner, or degree. Uh, unity is the union or harmony of a group of people. And so two drastically different things that we often get confused. And the danger with that is when we confuse those two things, 
um, a lot of times uniformity tricks us and it'll kind of disguise itself as unity. And we'll go, oh yeah, like they're totally in unity because they're all dressed the same. Well, that doesn't necessarily mean they're unified. It just means they're uniform. And so there's two different things. Uniformity equals sameness. Everybody say sameness. Sameness. So uniformity equals sameness. Unity equals togetherness. Everybody say togetherness. So two different things, sameness and togetherness. Uniformity, no room for differences. No room for differences. Unity, you can accept and tolerate differences. Okay, so you can... You have to understand that we can get it confused, but there are, it, it is really is two different things. And so when we settle for uniformity, there's a tragedy, a couple of tragedies that happen. We eliminate three things that are really kind of super important for us as humans. And so the first thing that is eliminated by uniformity is individual expression. And so when you when you make something uniform across the board, you kind of remove someone's ability to express themselves. So I got a couple examples. Any football fans? Okay, college football, raise your hand. Okay, NFL, raise your hand. There's a couple, okay. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna use this illustration because it's, the, it's, it's kind of the most obvious. If you watch football on any level, whether it's college or NFL, you'll see this, right? A lot of times in college, you'll see uh, teams that they wear the same jersey, maybe the same pants and helmet, but there's variety amongst the players. They might wear different cleats or whatever. The NFL, not so much, okay? The NFL has the tightest and strictest, strictest uniform policy out of all the professional sports. The Major League Baseball's uniform code is 400 words, where the NFL uniform code is 4,000 words. It's very strict, very specific, all the way down to your socks, must be this percentage of your sock must be white this percentage of your sock must be team color okay a lot of times if you watch uh, the NFL on Sundays you'll see players that have like their socks about mid shin it'll it'll be a color and then it'll stop and it'll be white the rest of the way and that's the uniform sock outline that's how it should be but then every once in a while you'll see a player that may have on a full length red or burgundy or black or whatever the team color is and there's not a lot of white showing guess what that player gets fined every time they wear that sock. So if you don't adhere to the, to the code, you get fined. And it's like $5,000 per instance that you wear the wrong socks. And I'm sure it goes up and, you know, compounds and different things. But they're very, very strict on their uniform code. Now, if you look at college, college sports, a little bit different, right? Any Alabama fans? Okay. We'll try that again. Any Alabama fans? You guys are losing some of your steam. You better pick it up. So Alabama's a good example. Just, okay, let me ask it this way. Re Alabama fans, just raise your hands. Just keep them up. Okay, keep your hands up if you legitimately, honestly love the uniforms. You love the uniforms. See all the hands going down? Okay. Here's where I'm going with this. Alabama's uniforms are standard. They, they are plain and, and simple, right? And there's nothing wrong with that. But, but how many of you know what color cleats Alabama requires their players to wear? Say it loud. Black. Anybody know what color shoestrings they have to wear? White. Anybody know what color socks they have to wear? It just depends. Sometimes they wear white, sometimes they wear black. But the point I'm trying to make is that there is, it's uniform across the board. There's no individual expression there. Certain organizations, certain teams, certain, or, uh, you know, especially in the NFL, you don't have a choice. They just require that you wear this color. You don't have a choice. And that's for a lot of different reasons. And so we can fall into this whole uniform thing, right, with work and school and different things. And so we've all seen different situations with that. But the point is that when you are adhering to a uniform, there's not a lot of individual expression. Would we all agree with that? So, so uniformity eliminates any kind of individual expression. Here's another great example. This one is, is my favorite example. Um, has anybody ever heard of a guy named Michael Jordan? Okay. Wow. Six people. Six people have heard of the greatest basketball player ever. Okay. Anyways, so Michael Jordan is a basketball player from... 
he started in 84 with the Chicago Bulls. I'm going to give you his whole life's bio here to catch up speed. Just kidding, not really. So in 1984, Michael Jordan comes into the NBA, and Nike signs him to a contract and says, hey, we want to produce a shoe for you. Here it is. Go wear it. It'll help. Boom, we're going to sell 100,000 shoes this year. Okay? So Michael Jordan puts this shoe on, and it's known, we know it as the Jordan 1, right? And it's red and black. That shoe, that particular shoe, became known as the Jordan 1 band because the NBA said, if you wear that shoe on the court, you will be fined. We are, that shoe is banned because they had a uniform code that was, you could either wear white shoes or black shoes, no color. And so he, he wanted to wear a red and black Jordan 1. Well, that shoe, since then, has become the most sought-after shoe in, like, sneaker culture. Like, if you have a pair of Jordan 1 band, you're sitting on a chunk of money, Right? because it, it's, it's an icon because it was banned by the NBA. They said, you can't wear it. So it's a, a great example of somebody who just said, hey, we just want individual expression. Uh, you know, it's, he's a 20-something-year-old rookie just trying to, you know, express himself. And the NBA says, no, sir, we have a uniform code, right? So here's a couple of instances of how uniformity will eliminate your individual expression. Uniformity will also eliminate um, specific purpose that you may have in your life. Okay, I'm going to use an example of uh, water. Okay, water, everybody's familiar with water. We all use it every day. We drink it. We do different things with it. Hopefully you bathe with it, right? So, so water is an important part of our life. But here's an interesting thing about water, and let's just go back to, I don't know when you learned this, but very early in life, you learn that water exists in three different states or three different forms, right? So you have, of course, the liquid, then you have solid, and then you have the gas form, right? So you have water, uh, water in three different forms. But here's the thing is that water is still water, whether it's ice, steam, or water. Water is it's still water, still has the same components, still made up the same. On the inside, water is the same, right? But on the outside, it's different, and it has different purposes. How bad would it be if we only had, if, if water was uniform? If we didn't have the variety of water that we had. Anybody ever take like steam showers when you don't feel good? You just like, I just want to steam myself and just get in a sauna or whatever. How bad would that be if you didn't have water in gas form? That would be tough to do, right? If you had a sports injury and you need to ice your knee, right? Anybody ever iced a knee or iced an injury? What if you didn't have a solid form? What if you just had liquid? You just put cold water in a sack? Or you just pour it on there and it gets the bed wet or the couch wet. Like there's, there's purposes for each thing, right? And so water exists in three different forms and each one has a specific purpose. Uniformity eliminates that, right? You look at just people, we all have different uses, different purposes, different gifts. If we're all uniform, it, all of that is eliminated, okay? So uniformity will eliminate your specific purpose. Uniformity also eliminates grace. No one needs grace to be a carbon copy. There's no grace required for that, right? If we're the same across the board, then grace doesn't exist for us. It's not necessary because what's, the, what's for you is for me and for you and for you, and it's all the same, and we're going to look the same, and we're going to act the same and talk the same, and there's no grace required for that. And so uniformity actually eliminates grace, but grace is required for us to be who God created us to be. And so we're going to look at why God doesn't really, he doesn't necessarily bless uniformity, but he absolutely blesses unity. And so we're going to, we've, now that we've talked about a little bit of the opposition of those two things, let's just jump into really how he blesses unity. So the best verse for me, the best section of scripture for this, I love it so much, is Psalms 133. So if you got your Bibles, you can turn there. It'll be on the screens. But Psalms 133 is really, really cool because it, it gives us a promise. Okay, so we're going to read this, uh, and you'll see the promise in here. It says, How truly wonderful and delightful to see brothers and sisters living together in sweet unity. And it goes on, verse 2, it says, It is, talking about unity, as precious as the sacred scented oil flowing from the head of the high priest Aaron, dripping down upon his beard, and running all the way down to the hem of his priestly robes. This heavenly harmony can be compared to the dew dripping down from the skies upon Mount Hermon 
refreshing the mountain slopes of Israel. For from this realm of sweet harmony, God will release his eternal blessing, the promise of life forever. And so it talks in here, it says, it mentions, it says, you might have seen where it said Mount Hermon. And it talks about the dew that drips down off of Mount Hermon. Well, a couple years ago, we took a group of young people to Israel. And we actually went to this, uh, this I can't remember the name of the actual place that we were at. It's, you know, it's, it, some of them have awkward names, really hard to pronounce. But we get there, and there's like a trail, and we get back to it, and there's just this opening and this clearing, and it's just a, it's just a little pool. Uh, it's probably 12, 14 inches deep, but it's just maybe, I don't know, 30, 40, 50 feet, and it's like a little pool of water. And you can get in it and kind of walk around, and it is freezing. The water is so cold. It was probably 100 degrees the day we were out there, and you're in the desert in Israel, but yet you walk up on this water, and it's 40 degrees. It's, I mean, it's so cold. And it felt so refreshing and just so good, right? And it was just kind of a cool place to stop and cool off and just kind of splash around and just relax. And then what we found out is the guy that was leading us said, this water actually starts out on the top, top of Mount Hermon over there. as that, You see the snow-capped mountain way over there? He goes, That's, that drips down, it runs down the mountain, and it runs to here. And so that's what this scripture is talking about is that specific thing, how the, the, the snow-capped mountain runs down and it becomes a place of refreshing out in the desert. Really, really cool. But if you look right above that, it talks, it gives us another picture. Okay, It says, unity is as precious as the sacred scented oil flowing from the head of the high priest Aaron, dripping down upon his beard and running all the way down to the hem of his priestly robe. And so Aaron had a uniform. As a priest, he had a uniform that he had to wear. It was a, all these priestly garments. You can go look it up. But in the middle of it was kind of like this breastplate, chestplate kind of thing. Um, and it had these 12, like, just picture like jewels, 12 gems or something like that, just kind of scattered around it. And each gem or each little stone represented a tribe, one of the different tribes of Israel. So you have 12 tribes. And so what this verse is explaining to us, it gives us a great picture of unity. It says that as an anointing, they would pour oil on his head and it would run down his beard. Okay, we, we've used oil for things like that around here. If you've been to Freedom Conference, you've probably been anointed with oil. Pastor Zach and Pastor Anna were anointed not long ago. They had oil dumped all over their heads. And you got to see a picture of what this means. And basically it just means it's an, an anointing. That's what the oil represents. And so they would anoint the priest and it would run down his beard and then it would drip onto his robe, and it would run all the way down his robe and all the way off the hem of his robe at the bottom. And so as it drips off his beard, right, if you look at the specifics of this, it says it drips down his beard and then runs all the way down to the hem. So it's just dripping down. And so the oil is running over that chest plate or breast plate or, you know, and so every tribe that is represented by those stones is being anointed by that oil. And so that's, that's part of that, what that was. So it's all being anointed at once. So there's a great picture of unity there. And so all of the tribes are receiving the same anointing, but they're all different. Everybody say different. And so that's a great picture of what unity really looks like in, in an anointing, right? And so I love that verse. I love what it says. There's several more that we're going to touch. Um, and 1 Corinthians 1 is uh, another great one that really talks about how living in unity um, can prevent something else. Okay, so let's read it. It says, I urge you, my brothers and sisters, and this is Paul, of course, writing to the church. It says, for the sake of the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to agree to live in unity with, with, with one another and put to rest any division that attempts to tear you apart. Anybody know we got some division in the world today, right? We got some division. So it says, live in unity with one another. Put to rest any division that attempts to tear you apart. Be restored as one united body, living in perfect harmony. And I love the way this, this reads. Form a consistent choreography among yourselves. Having a common perspective with shared values. And so we were watching uh, this old Shark Week thing a couple of nights ago. Anybody love Shark Week? I love Shark Week. It's so great. And they showed uh, the way that these, these sharks and things were hunting, and they were hunting sardines. And if you've ever seen sardines in the ocean, it's pretty ridiculous. 
I mean, there's like hundreds, thousands of these little fish swimming together in a school. And there's no one, there's not like one fish in the front that's like directing traffic or anything. They're just, if something comes up, they, it's like they all just move at the same time. And it is the wildest thing if you just watch them. It's like, how in the world do these hundreds of thousands of little fish all look like one big giant blob that just moves at the same time? Well, it's because they're in unity. And the way this word words it is form a consistent choreography. And so if you can picture that, that's what Paul is saying to the church. It's like, you guys should operate in a way where it doesn't take one person standing in the front going, this is the way we're going to go. Hey, we need to turn left. We need to turn right. It doesn't require that. He's saying, as the church, you should operate in such unity that you're in consistent choreography together, that when it's time to move, everybody moves together. And so he's really, really encouraging that. And he says the only way you can do that is if you put to rest any division, not the ones you don't like or the ones that are obvious, but like anything that can be divisive has to be put to rest. And we joke about this a lot in, in church world, and maybe you've heard this before, but a lot of times... It's, it's, I, I, it's weird that I even say this, and, and it's real. But churches will split big, over some of the smallest little things that don't really matter. We joke about churches splitting because of the color of the carpet, but that's a real thing. We talk about churches that split because they don't like the way the pastor started dressing. So we're, we're going to split and start our own church. Or, you know, pastor got this type of vehicle. So we're not doing that. Or somebody in the church, you know, they let their kid go to that school. So we're leaving the church. Does that sound ridiculous to anybody else or just me? Okay. That, those are real things. And we've heard some of those here, you know. And it's so, so crazy. And he says, put to rest any division, anything that would be de- divisive, uh, put it to rest. Because when you have any type of division, you no longer have a vision. And just like those sardines, they have one vision. One, stay alive. Don't let the sharks eat you. So we're all going to work together, and we're all just going to move together as one big family, one big school, and we're going to stay out of trouble together because they have one vision. They have a shared vision. So there is no die vision, okay? So when you have die vision, you no longer have a vision. Um, And then we jump to Galatians. And a lot of these are New Testament things because... Uh, as I'm going to talk about in a minute, like we're, we're a New Testament church. And so a lot of this is very applicable to us right now. And so Galatians 3 says, In Christ's family there can be no division into Jew and non-Jew, slave and free, male and female. Among us, you are all equal. That is, we are all in a common relationship with Jesus Christ. Also, since you are Christ's family, then you are Abraham's famous descendant, which means you are an heir according, according to the covenant promise. And so, any parents, raise your hand if you're a parent. Okay, keep your hands up. Okay, if you're a parent with multiple children, keep your hands up. All right, let's pray for all these people right now. You look at them, they're like, we keep my hand up because I want to receive it. Come on with it. So, okay, you can put your hands down. I am a parent of multiple children. We have three, and all of the parents of multiple children... I know 100% we are unified in what I'm about to say. How many of you know that each one of your kids are different than the other, right? There are differences between those three. They're like, I don't understand how they all come from the same parents, but they all got different brains, and they don't, one, one that makes decent decisions, the other one not so much, right? Or the other one is all over the place, throwing cake batter all over the walls. That's a real life example in my house. Okay, we got one that's a kind of a neat freak and one that just don't care. And I'm like, how do these two kids come from the same people? I don't get it. But it's, it's a fact, right? And, and that's just how it is. And it's because distinction is okay. Distinction does not equal disunity. So we have to understand that. Sometimes we think because somebody's a little bit different that we can't be unified with that person. But if you've got multiple kids, if you're a parent of multiple kids, you see this every day, you're like, man, these, these kids are different, right? And I don't know if y'all say this, this is what I say, like my kids, my older two think that Logan is my favorite. They're like, yeah, she's your favorite, you love her the most. I don't love her more than I love them, I just love her different, right? And that's just, that's part of being a parent. But we're all unified in, in our family 
But yeah, there are distinctions amongst everybody, right? And so we have to understand that as part of the church, in Christ's family, there could be no division, although there may be some distinctions. Okay, and so you're going to see this again in just a moment. But just because there are distinctions does not mean that's disunity. It doesn't mean that there's division. So you have to really clearly see the difference, okay? And so this next phrase, what I'm about to say, is kind of the thing, the linchpin um, that I started with. I kind of just had this thought, and I didn't really know what it meant until the closer we got to today. And then I realized I was supposed to share this with you guys. And so all of this developed from this statement. And it's just simple, right? But unity is greater than uniformity. And I think if we can understand this piece, this is, I I honestly believe this is what our world's missing because we go through day to day and we see all the divisions in the world and we're like, well, if they would just be like this or if you would just be like that. No, that's uniformity, okay? But let's find some common ground and figure out where the unity is. And I think that will solve a lot of our issues, not just in this church, but in our city, in our state, in our country, in our world. If we just go, you know what? Unity is greater than uniformity. And a clear picture of this is Ephesians 4. And so Ephesians 4, uh, starting in verse 4, it says, You were all called to travel on the same road and in the same direction. So stay together both outwardly and inwardly. You have one master, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who rules over all, works through all, and is present in all. Everything you are and think and do is permeated with oneness. Everybody say unity. Look at this. But that doesn't mean you should all look and speak and act the same. That would be uniformity. And so he very clearly says, you should have unity, but you should not be uniform. And so there's a group of people, and maybe there's at least one or two of you in here that have either experienced this in the past, maybe you're experiencing it right now, or maybe you know somebody that has, that would either not come to church or didn't want to be a church or didn't, didn't think that they could be a part of God's family because they didn't dress a certain way, or they didn't speak a certain way, or they didn't look a certain way. And I just, I want us all to understand that that's not, that's not our goal. That's not God's desire. Uniform, that's uniformity, and that's really, it, it disguises itself as unity, and it's very dangerous. And so I'm, gonna, I'm about to say three things that um, can jeopardize, and there's a lot at risk in what I'm about to say, okay? So I need everybody to take a deep breath. Because I'm about to say three things that hopefully will help you understand that you don't have to act a certain way. You don't have to dress a certain way to be a part of God's family. Okay, everybody ready? There's no such thing as a heavenly haircut. Right? Y'all know that? You don't have to have your hair cut a certain way to be a part of God's family. That sounds a little ridiculous when I say it, doesn't it? Y'all were like thinking it was going to be something super profound and like really deep. And I'm like, there's no such thing as a heavenly haircut. And you're like, is that it? That's all you got? But think about it. How many times has somebody that you know gone into a church and felt like they didn't fit in maybe because their hair was purple? Or because they had a spiked up haircut or, or whatever? You know, you can't, I can't go to that church because I have a mohawk. How ridiculous does that sound? But it's true. But there's no such thing as a heavenly haircut. There's no such thing, ladies, as a romper of righteousness. And possibly some men too, I guess. Now they make men's rompers. That's so weird. So any, any ladies love a good romper? Look at them. See? So many rompers. They all love them. But there's, it's like you don't have to wear a certain thing, right? To be in God's family and to be righteous before God. You don't have to wear a certain piece of clothing. And sometimes we forget that. And this one's my favorite. There's no such thing as kingdom kicks. Right? I have literally heard people say they felt like they didn't fit in because they didn't have expensive shoes. And, And a lot of that comes from me being in youth ministry and hearing kids say that. And it hurts my 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 feelings every time, right? It kind of breaks my heart because it's more than, it's not even about the shoes. I think every, every kid, every person, maybe not every, I know I experienced it, 
experiences a little bit of that as you're growing up. You know, you go to school and people make fun of your shoes because you don't have the nicest shoes as somebody else. And that kind of hurts a little bit. Because when you look at it this way, all that's doing is creating division. And now, like, in order for me to be accepted, I have to keep up with you and what you put on your feet. And I'm a, I'm a, I am a lover of shoes. I love shoes, right? And so, but, but that's one of those things, like, we just have to understand that, like, to be a part of God's family, you don't have to wear your hair a certain way. If you like a butt cut, go with it. <laughs> right? Right, Matt? Yeah, if you, got, if you got a mullet, ain't nobody going to say nothing. Just go with the mullet. If you got a good mullet now, that, you're like a rock star. People love mullets, right? But no, like, it doesn't matter, right? If you wear Tommy Hilfiger or Nike or whatever, like, who cares? Like, do you love God? Do you love Jesus? Like, are you, are you about serving in his house? And, and, you know, I don't care what you wear. We don't, it doesn't matter. And then, you know, but I will say this. If I have to pick a shoe that I have to wear for all of eternity in heaven, I hope it's a Jordan 1. That's all I'm saying. If that's what I got to pick at the gate, then that's what I'm going with, okay? But Ephesians 4, it jumps in, it, it tells us that, and then it goes into this. It says, out of the generosity of Christ, each of us is given his own gift. And this is what you guys have probably heard before. He handed out gifts of apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher to train Christ's followers in skilled servant work. Okay, look, this is for us. Working within Christ's body, the church. He's talking about us. Within the church family. Until we're all moving rhythmically and easily with one another. Everybody say unity. That's the picture of those sardines I was talking about. Is they move rhythmically and easily with each other. And what are the benefits of that? Protection, right? They stay alive. They're together, you know, in a, in, a, in a group, they look bigger and it's more intimidating than if one is single off by itself. And so until we're all moving rhythmically and easily with one another, we need to continue working together with unity, is what it's saying. Efficient and graceful in response to God's son, fully mature adults. Anybody a fully mature adult? No, we're still working on it, aren't we? Still working. All right. Fully developed within and without. Anybody? Fully developed within and without? Nope, okay. What about fully alive like Christ? Anybody got there yet? Okay, so obviously we're all in, in progress, right? Under construction. And so it says, until we're all moving rhythmically and easily with each other, which we don't do well, we're still not there with that. Until we're efficient and graceful in response to God's son, uh, sometimes we are, sometimes not so much. Until we're fully mature adults, until we're fully developed within and without, and until we are fully alive like Christ, we should be working together as the church, as one body, one team, one family, right? And then it says we take our lead from Christ, who is the source of everything we do. He keeps us in step with each other. His very breath and blood flow through us, nourishing us so that we will grow up healthy in God, robust in love. And this is a great sign of maturity, Okay, that's what it's telling us is this is the mark of maturity is when we get to a place where we're not waiting on Pastor Ivy or Pastor Benet to tell us where we're going. We're not waiting on the, the, the point person to lead us. We're being led by Jesus. We're being led by God and we're following that lead. And sure, our pastors are here for leadership, for sure. But I think sometimes we connect to the personality rather than, than the purpose. And so the personality is here to, like, they are sent here by God, anointed by God to lead us, absolutely. But if you're not first seeking your leadership from Jesus and God, then they're always gonna let you down, okay? And so what this says is when we take our lead from Christ, who is the source of everything we do, he keeps us in step with each other. His very breath and blood flow through us, nourishing us so that we will grow up healthy in God, robust in love. When we reach this point where we're following Christ first, okay, following Christ first, this is spiritual health, and this is where we find out that that's where it means robust with love. That's where you start to see that. Now, that doesn't mean that you don't, you're disrespectful and dishonoring to the, the authority above you. That's not it at all. But it's just that you're taking your leadership from God first. So we jump into the book of Acts, and this is kind of home base for the, for the New Testament church. This is home base for our church. This is where you gain so much insight into what unity is in the church. 
Okay, so as we read this, um, you're going to see a couple of great models of unity. And these are probably some of the best models of unity that you'll ever see. Okay, and so as we talk about this, I'm going to set it up really quick. So if you need to find it, we're going to be in Acts 2. But this is a great model and structure of what church should look like and, the, and, and how churches should be set up. But it also gives us that great model of unity. And so Peter's just preached the gospel. He's told all these people uh, in Jerusalem about what happened with Jesus. And he has kind of laid it out for them and said, hey, look, because of some of the things that you did, Jesus had to die on the cross. And, and that was for you. It was kind of because of you and, and really for you. And so he lays this out there for him, and so he presents the gospel in a very clear way. And so then we're going to look at what happens after that, okay? So Acts 2, starting in verse 37, Peter, Peter presents this to them, and this is how they respond. When they heard this, they were crushed and realized what they had done to Jesus. Deeply moved, they said to Peter and the other apostles, What do we need to do, brothers? Peter replies, Repent and turn to God. Each one of you must be baptized in the name of Jesus, the anointed one, to have your sins removed. Then you may take hold of the gift of the Holy Spirit. For God's promise of the Holy Spirit is for you and your families, for those yet to be born, and for everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. Peter preached to them and warned them with these words, be rescued from the wayward and perverse culture of this world. Those who believed the word that day numbered 3,000. They were all baptized and added to the church. And so this is really kind of one of the first like corporate church gatherings. Okay, this is kind of what launches the whole church as a, as a, as a gathering in, in the history of, of humanity, really. It just kind of starts right here. And it starts with, hey, Peter, like we don't like what we caused. How, what do we do? How do we fix it? What do we need to do? Which is a lot of times, if we're just kind of honest, I don't know about y'all, but sometimes I go, man, I, I, don't, I need some help. I need to know what to do here. I don't know. I, I need some advice from, you know, from a parent or from a friend or maybe in some situations I'm just like, this is beyond what any human can, can fathom. I need some help from God. Like, God, help me here. What do I do? Right? So we're always kind of looking for like, what do we do? How do we respond to this? And Peter pretty much just lays it out for him and says, hey, I'm glad that you're owning this. Here's, here's what you do. He says, repent and, and return to God. And then he says, then be baptized in the name of Jesus and then take hold of the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so this is the picture, uh, the ultimate picture of unity for me. Because there's this phrase that we use that was never really used in the Bible. And it's the phrase that it's called the Holy Trinity. And you never really see it in scripture in that word. But what that means is Trinity mean, obviously means what? Try unity. Three pieces all together in unity as one. And so what Peter's saying is that, look, in order for you to get over what you did, in order for you to move past this moment and this mistake or whatever it is that you did, you have to find this, you have to find this unity with this triune being is kind of what he's saying. And so it, it's really simple. Re repent and return to God. That's the Father. Then he says, be baptized in the name of Jesus. That's the Son. And take hold of the gift of the Holy Spirit. So he, he lays it out for them right there. Like, hey, look, this is how you fix it. You got to go over here because this is the ultimate source of unity. And without that, you're going to struggle with the division your whole life. And so just like earlier, I talked about the water. That's, that's what the Trinity is, right? It's God in three different forms. It's kind of neat to think about it that way. But you have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Three different purposes, three different gifts, three different applications, but all the same God on the inside. 100% God. So it's really neat to relate those two things. And so what we see in this scripture is that God ultimately has two desires as it relates to unity. The first one is God's ultimate desire is that we would be in union with him and that we would have unity with God. So that's his number one desire. We see that because that's Peter's first, first response to them. What do we do? What do we do now? We are tired of this life. 
we are tired of doing these things. What do we do? How do we fix it? He goes, we have to be in union with God. You have to find unity. It says, those who believed the word that day numbered 3,000. They were all baptized, 300 salvation, 3,000 salvations, 3,000 baptisms. And then look, then they were all added to the church. And we don't, we think, oh, that means they just started going. No, they became the church. And so this is kind of the first point in time where you see next steps happening. He says, you saw 3,000 saved, 3,000 baptized, 3,000 added to the church. So God's first desire is that we would be in union with him. His second desire is that we would be in unity with each other. Unity is a family. Unity is a church. And so Peter goes on and he talks about this. He says, this is in verse 42, every believer, okay, every, talking about the 3,000, every believer was faithfully devoted to following the teachings of the apostles. Their hearts were mutually linked to one another. Everybody say unity. Sharing communion. Everybody say unity. And coming together regularly for prayer. Everybody say unity. A deep sense of holy awe swept over everyone, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. Okay, let me pause right here because I think maybe not just our church, but in our world, I think maybe the reason that we don't see as many signs and miraculous wonders and things happening and we wonder why all of this crap has kind of popped off in our, in our world. I think ultimately it's because there's not a lot of unity. Because it clearly says their hearts were mutually linked to one another. How many people are you mutually linked to on a heart level? It says they share communion and they come together regularly for prayer. A deep sense of holy awe swept over everyone. And that's when they saw miracles, signs, and wonders. It says all the believers were in fellowship as one body. Everybody say unity. And they shared with one another whatever they had. Out of generosity, they even sold their assets to distribute the proceeds to those who were in need among them. You saw a picture of that at the beginning with our East Watini campus and what Carson City sent them. Verse 46. Daily they met together. Everybody say unity. Daily they met together in the temple courts and in one another's homes to celebrate communion. They shared meals together, everybody say unity, with joyful hearts and tender humility. They were continually filled with praises to God, enjoying the favor of all the people. And look at this, look at how it ends. And the Lord kept adding to their number daily those who were coming to life. See, er, earlier we talked about Psalms 133 where God says, look, where, where brothers and sisters dwell together in unity, that's where I'll command the blessing, right there. Here you see it again, where people are dwelling together in unity. God says, here's the blessing. The church is expanding. People are, people are eating meals together and praying together, and people are growing and, and developing, and everybody's moving in the same direction with the same perspectives and the same value. There's this consistent choreography that's happening, right? We're all following the lead of Jesus and following the lead of, of God, our Father. And the number keeps growing of those who are coming to life. It doesn't say that necessarily hey, the church got so big they had to build another building. It says those who were coming to life. And, I, and maybe you're new, maybe you're not, but our mission here is to see people experience life and live it to the absolute fullest. And so just like in Acts 2, the, the mission here was for people to experience life. And so this is kind of the first picture of next steps. We see Peter, he says, hey, here's what you need to do. Repent, turn to God. Be baptized in the name of Jesus and then take hold, then take hold of the gift of the Holy Spirit in that order. And after you've done that, then follow the teaching of the one that God anointed to teach. Share communion, pray together, remain in fellowship, connect through small groups, serve together, worship together, experience life together. And that's the, that's the greatest picture of unity that you're ever going to find, period. But the best thing about that is that there's not one ounce of uniformity there. There's not one piece of that where God says, 
Make sure you wear a blue shirt and part your hair on the left, okay? And everybody who has to wear size 10s, whether they fit or not. There's none of that. There's no, there's no hey, you gotta wear white laces on your black cleats. There's, there's no uniform policy to be a believer, to be a, a son or a daughter of, of God. But there is a policy of unity and it is God's desire, first desire is that we are in union with him and number two, that we are in union with one another. And that's, that's, I can look around the room right now and I don't really see any two people that are dressed the exact same. Now, some people have on the same color shirts and, you know, two people are wearing hats and, but they're different hats, right? And so we can easily mistake unity and uniformity if we're not careful. And that's what, that's what's been a danger to the church for so long is that people think they have to meet a certain criteria or a certain guideline just to be a part of it. But in reality, God says, Here are, here's the criteria. Repent and, turn and return to God. Then after that, go through baptism. Then after that, realize that God has gifted you with something. The gift of the Holy Spirit is yours. And take hold of it. And that's, that's the three steps. That's it. You don't have to wear a suit or wear a plaid shirt or wear jeans or wear khakis. There's no, there's none of that. And so I want to end today just by doing kind of a two-part invitation, of course, because, you know, I just want that, I feel like that needs to line up with what God shows us right here, that there's, there's an there's an invitation for unity with God, and then there's an invitation for unity with each other. And I feel like we are at a time in our world, and I, I think most of us can just, if we're honest, we'll look around, we'll agree, that unity is, is a rare commodity right now, right? Basically, anything that, that comes up on social media or shows up on Facebook news or whatever, it's just division and division and it's left or right or white or black or whatever, it doesn't matter. It's just all this division. But if we just really kind of drill down deep, I think, I think the answer is we, we don't have unity with God and we don't have unity with each other, period. And that's why we're seeing a lot of the issues that we see, not just in, on the news in other cities, but even here and even probably some in your families because maybe there's a lack of unity somewhere. So I think I just need to offer this up and, and, you know, this is not something that I have that I'm giving to you. This is something that God says is available to all of us. And so I'm going to ask everybody just to kind of bow your heads, close your eyes. We're just going to do it kind of private style. Sometimes we do this, sometimes we don't. If you're online, this absolutely goes for you too. You've got a host there with you and they can, they can walk you through this. But really, it's, it's really simple. It's just um, all we're going to do is offer up uh, an invitation to be in union with God and to join him in unity. And so maybe for some of us, we've done that before, but we don't feel like maybe, maybe you just said it at a, at a youth camp or you did something and you just really don't, didn't understand it, couldn't wrap your mind around it. And you don't really understand what unity with God means, but maybe now you have a different understanding of that. So possibly this is for you. And there's a lot of people that haven't ever said that. And so if you're one of those people, this could be for you. And so really it's very simple. We're just gonna do what, what the Bible says to do. And so Peter tells these people, repent and return to God. And that's easy, as easy as ABC, literally. Admit, believe, and confess. And so I'm gonna walk you through this. It's very simple. If that's you and you've got that feeling, then you can just pray along with me. All you've got to say is, is something like this. Father God, I thank you for all that you've done for me. God, I admit that I have made mistakes, that I, I admit that I have sinned against you. I admit that I've been selfish. God, I do believe that you sent your son Jesus to die for me, to eliminate all that. And so, God, I 
confess in this moment that you are my Lord and Savior. And I ask that you will lead and guide me for the rest of my life. Amen. Now, if you said that, we need to celebrate because the Bible says that the old you is dead and the new you, there's a new you, there's a new version of you in Christ. And so that's probably the greatest decision you'll ever make in your life, hands down. And that's the first step. That's, that's, that's it. That's the starting point. And so if that's you, we want to celebrate with you. We want to honor you. Um, all I'm asking you to do, and I can see part of the room, uh, I can see more now with my glasses on than I could last week, but I just want you to raise your hand so that I can see it. And nobody's going to look around, nothing weird's going to happen. Thank you. I can see you. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, God, I pray for these people. God, I thank you for their boldness, their, their courage. God, I ask that you would bless them as they are now in unity with you. God, I pray that you would lead them and guide them, um, that, that Jesus would be the one that they follow, um, and that there would be ultimate union with you. God, thank you for these people. So then there's a second group that I mentioned, and this is the second part of Peter's invitation, and so it's the second part of ours, and it's basically just, hey, look, all of the believers, every believer, and then he names a bunch of stuff, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to challenge all of us as believers, all of you that uh, say, hey, I'm in union with God right now. I'm going to challenge you. And some of this is going to sting maybe a little bit, but we've taken offense off the table, so we're not going to be offended. We're going to let this challenge us in a healthy way. But I'm going to ask you, are, who are you, and I asked this earlier, who are you mutually linked to in, on a heart level? Okay, who, who do you share communion with? Who do you pray with? Who are you in fellowship with as one body? Who do you meet together with, right? Who do you do communion with? Like, who do you eat meals with? Who are you coming to life with? And so those are some hard questions maybe because some of us would say, well, I don't really have those people. And so the next steps of the Bible, uh, of the book of Acts right here are repent and turn to God. If you've done that, okay. Be baptized in the name of Jesus. So if you're one of those people that just raised your hand, the Bible says that your next step is baptism. Okay, take hold of the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then, this is for the rest of us. This is for the believers that say, I'm in union with God, but I'm not, I'm not sure if I'm in union with others. Are you following the teaching of the ones that God has anointed to teach? Or are you just thinking, hey, I can get a message on YouTube any day. Right? Who has God anointed to lead you and your, and your family? Is it, is it here? Is it another church? Is it, you, have to, you have to decide who is God appointed to be the teacher. Share communion. Pray together. Remain in fellowship. Are you in a small group? If you're not in a small group, like get in a small group. And I get it. There's a lot of hurdles and there's a lot of stuff happening in the world and schedules are weird and things, masks are being worn and places are not open and different things. Listen, there are small groups meeting every week at this church, not at this church, but all over the place. And there's a lot of people that will go to Target, but they won't go to small group. So get, make sure you're in a small group. Are you serving this is how we express ourselves and how we share with other people. And this is a form of generosity. We, we share our talents and our time. So serve, our worship together. Make sure that you're here. You guys that are online, you're worshiping with us. So we thank you for that. And make sure that you're experiencing life together with someone, with a group of people. Look around the room. I know the lights are off, but you guys can see each other. This, this is a family. And so as a part of God's family, we're in union with him, but we're also in union with each other. And where unity is, God commands the blessing. And I don't know about y'all, but I want the blessing. Anybody else want a blessing today? All right, well, let's do this then. Let's, let's do a, I think we're going to do something a little bit different. Everybody stand up. Let's do it this way. Everybody, everybody wants a blessing. And so God says, where there's unity, there will be a blessing. And I know we're not doing the like, we're not going to hold hands and all the social distancing stuff, got it. But 
think we can still be in unity and we can still receive the blessing that God has for us. So everybody on the count of three, okay? You're just gonna say, bless me, okay? That's all we're gonna say. Ready? One, two, three. And I think it's that simple. God hears our voices. He hears our hearts. He knows where he knows what, what our, desire, our desires are. And if we can line up with his desires for us, then he will absolutely bless you. And so let me pray over you. I'm gonna bless you right now. God, I thank you for this family. I thank you for this group of people. God, I pray right now for unity in every family that's represented, represented <clears throat> in this room or online. God, I pray that those families experience a blessing today like they never have before. I don't know how you're gonna do that, but God, I know that it's coming because your word says that where brothers and sisters dwell together in unity, that you will command a blessing. So God, we receive that blessing. God, we're looking forward to that blessing. And when we receive that blessing, we're gonna give you all the glory for it. So God, it was great to be in your house today. God, we love what you're doing in this church. We love what you're doing in the world. As crazy as it may seem, God, we love it because you're stirring something and you're leading us to unity with you. And so, God, as we move in your direction, God, would you move in ours? We love you, God. It's in Jesus' name. Amen.